What's up guys? Welcome back to part three of three of this video series. I guess you can call it a series. Uh, it wasn't intended to be, but it just takes too long to do one massive video. And it's funny because part one was an hour long, part two was an hour long. I think part three is gonna be an hour long. All three together are just as long as like a real motion picture movie. <laughs> so I hope I get an Oscar for this. Anyways, part three of three, uh, the video uh, where I talk about my most favorite materials and also my most used materials. And then I throw in a couple of my not so favorite materials. So uh, as with the other videos, uh, the prior two videos, uh, I go through all my different bins each bin is a different category of uh, materials and I just pick out some of my favorite and most used ones. We talk them about it for a little bit and then we move on to the next bin or category of materials. So to start this one off, I've got here what I call my woody amber materials. And woody ambers are a lot of things, but for the most part they're a synthetic bases uh, that are a combination of obviously something that smells woody but also that something that smells ambery meaning ambery in a sense of ambergris animalic so dark woody usually sharp and piercing usually pretty dry and usually pretty strong uh, with the exception of a few which i still have uh, some as my favorite so which ones do i reach for the most and that are my most favorite I can tell you right now, I have an absolute love for IFF's Amber Extreme. This one to me is always my go-to woody amber. If I need a woody amber, this is my first go-to as a try. Like I'll always try this first and if it doesn't work, I'll re, re look at some of the other options. But this is always my first go-to and it's just, it's perfect because if you go out and buy every single woody amber material, like I've got a good portion of them. Uh, some of them are too dark, some of them are too light, some of them are too weak, some of them are too strong, some are too dry, some are this, some are that. But for some reason, Amber Extreme to me sits right in the middle and it works for almost any application where you need a typical woody ambery note. Um, the only thing with Amber Extreme that is off-putting to some people is one, it's super, super strong. Um, I keep uh, actually two different dilution levels. I've got one at 2% dilution and one at 0.5%, depending on how I need to dose this and depending on what perfume uh, requires a certain you know kind of dosing. But for Amber Extreme to me, usually I like to keep it and sit it at one, to maybe four parts per thousand max. Usually one to two parts per thousand for me sits perfectly uh, because it's super, super strong. And it's one of those, uh, what I call the, the ass kicking materials where it's just like just a tiny, the tiniest little drop will just really kick the perfume in the ass and send it places. Now, it's not a building block material, meaning uh, you don't want to go heavy handed. You don't want to go overboard with something like this. It is definitely not like a like an Izoe Super or something light in building block ish. Uh, it's a super, super, super strong ass kicking material that you use in minor, super small doses. So that's IFF Amber Extreme. Love this stuff. Um, now let me pull out a couple here. So also in this bin is where I keep my, I guess you can say my Ambroxans. I mean, technically they're not woody ambers, but usually when I reach for a woody amber, there's probably gonna be some sort of Ambroxan in the formula somehow, somewhere. They usually go hand in hand with me. Um, so. There's different kinds of Ambroxans. You've got uh, like just regular Ambro Fix Flakes, which is just your standard Ambroxan. You've got Cetalox. Um, you've got um, Ambrox Super. There's Ambrox DL. And they're all one and the same. They're all the kind of amber, like the synthetic, I don't want to call them synthetic ambergris because they don't smell anything like ambergris. 
but they are the typical Ambroxan notes with subtle, slight differences between them all. But for the most part, they could all be used interchangeably in a formula and not really much of a big impact will happen. So if you look at a formula and it calls for, you know, 2% Ambroxan, and if you don't have Ambroxan and you only have Cetalox, use Cetalox. It's pretty much the same. It's not going to ruin your formula. It's going to pretty much do the same thing. Subtle, slight differences that only people that have been around the materials long enough can pick out the nuances. But to the average consumer, the end user, the one buying the perfume will never know the difference. Um, so between all the different uh, Ambroxans, what are, what's my favorite? Uh, I've got two favorites. One is Ambrox Super, which I believe Ambrox Super is made from Ferminich. And what Ambrox Super sets apart from regular Ambroxan or regular Ambro Fixed Flakes is to me, it is just a hair bit stronger. Um, a little bit stronger. And it has a little subtle sweetness undertone where a lot of Ambroxan will usually have a shade of woodiness underneath it. Uh, Ambrox Super also has that same kind of woodiness, but you can, there's a faint sweetness that I get from it that I don't get from regular Ambroxan or Ambro Fix Flakes. Um, so I like Ambrox Super for that reason. It's a little bit stronger, touch bit sweeter, and it just has a little bit more character than regular Ambroxan, to my nose. I mean, somebody else might pick up something different. So Ambrox Super, I really, 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 really love that stuff. Now, my second favorite uh, Ambroxan would be Cetalox, for the same reason why I like Ambrox Super. To me, Cetalox is a shade sweeter, ever so slightly sweeter than regular Ambro, Ambro Fix or uh, Ambroxan. And there's just this delicateness to it Whereas Ambroxan has a dryness, uh, Cetalox has a more delicate, kind of almost pillowiness. It's, it smells a little bit more regal, um, just a little bit nicer, refined regal with a hint of sweetness. So Cetalox is my second go-to. And then of course, if I'm just like, eh, I don't care, I'll grab regular Ambroxan. But if I do care in the formula and the Ambroxan note is important to me in the formula where it's gonna be high dosage, you know, a featured, I want somebody to be like, yes, I pick up Ambroxan in this. I'll use the Ambrox Super or the Cetalox first. But if it's just a small dosage, just to give the, the formula just a little, just a little something something, I'll just usually just grab the regular Ambroxan Ambro Fixed Flakes and that does just fine. Now, um, I'll talk about the, the woody amber material that I've been adoring lately. Um, so everybody probably knows that Furminich has a material called Z11. Uh, Z11 is a woody amber material, but there's something dark and musky about it that I really, really enjoy. Um, so it's a different, it's almost like on a different class of woody amber, where if you smell like amber extreme or ambrosinide or norlimbinol nor and stuff like that, those all have this, the, the typical characteristics of a woody amber that's very piercing, dry, you know, in your face and cutthroat. Z11 from Furminich, uh, to me is the more elegant, the more refined version of it. It's not as dry and it almost has a more soft shaded kind of pillowy muskiness to it. And it's definitely darker. It smells darker to me. Um, and I really enjoy that. So it gives it that nice elegant feel to a fragrance. So if you want a woody amber that is still pretty potent and pretty strong, like Z11, it's one of those weird materials where it's effective even in low doses. Like if you're doing maybe one to two parts per thousand, you'll detect the difference. But you could even go all, you know, as high as 1% in the formula, you know, 1.5% and really load this stuff in. And it doesn't get in your face and too dry like some of the other woody ambers. It just stays nice and elegant. Um, but it's definitely strong enough where I would never use it as a building block material. Um, and what I mean by building block, I mean something that a material you would use in excess of, you know, like say 5% of the formula or something like that. Uh, Z11, no way, I wouldn't go that high because it's, it's pretty strong. 
However, I'm not here to talk about Z11. What I do want to talk about that has been my most favorited uh, Woody Amber material as of these, you know, past month is Z11 HD. Furminich just released a newer Z11 uh, material a month ago. I don't know if it was a captive or whatnot, but it was just released to the public. And as of right now, nobody sells it. Uh, you have to either purchase it directly from Furminich or uh, get it from like Vigon by the Kilo. Um, but what I like about Z11 HD is it's the same characteristic as Z11, but it is much, much more cleaner. It's not as dark now, but there is this... It's so hard to describe. I think Furminich nails you know hits the you know the the head on the nail when they call it hd because it smells like a high definition version and basically the the major differences between regular z11 and z11 hd is z11 is a mixture of isomers of uh, amber ketal and i don't know what the exact percentage is but i think it's usually like maybe 45 percent uh, is the the good active uh, amber ketol isomer in uh, Z regular Z11, but Z11 HD is kind of like their hedione HC version, where it's the the good active isomer is up in the high 90 percentile. So it's the it's the scent that you want in the much higher percent range. It doesn't necessarily mean it's stronger. The funny thing is, is when I take these two. Uh, and I put them in a formula side by side, one with this one, and replicate the same formula, do the same dosage with the HD version. I don't necessarily smell it as stronger. I do smell it as just, it's, it's cleaner and more refined and not as dark. And when I smell it now, it almost has a subtle shade of sweetness to it, kind of like what Cetalox has in comparison to ambroxan so regular z11 you know a nice dry woody amber with a nice pillowy musky darkness it's nice it's good stuff but z11 hd is that same material it's cleaner slightly brighter and it has this almost ambergris like sweetness in the undertone so it's just freaking lovely. And it's been my favorite material. Like I'm trying to dump this in every formula or every trial batch that I do, cause it just works so well. It's, you know, Z11 HD from Furminich. You gotta check it out once a retailer starts selling it. Um, and then last but not least, I'll talk about my favorite what i call building block woody amber materials these are the woody amber materials that are not so strong that you can use in excess of um a lot of and use it as a building block to build kind of like the skeleton of the perfume uh one is i believe this is from simrise this is uh yisamber or yisamber k yisamber k yisamber k this one's nice i mean there's not really much special to talk about it other than it's a nice, dark, woody, slightly vetiverish, uh, woody amber material. Very light, very delicate, and you can really pile this on in a formula and it's really not gonna overpower or take over. It's just a good building block material that I love using. And then of course, uh, Simrise also makes uh, Amberwood F, which is uh, also known as, uh, I believe it's a uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, like Brizambernine Forte or something like that. It's, it goes by many names, but uh, Simrise sells it as Amberwood F. And to me, it's another building block material. You can use it in access. It's the typical woody ambery, like a slightly, slightly ambergris, slightly cedar wood. And it's just a good building block material. And that's another one I try to go for. You know, I try to reach for all the time. Okay. So that is it with the woody amber materials that I like to use a lot. Uh, I believe there's actually a couple out here that I probably should have mentioned. Like all this mess is another formula that, that I'm working on. And I know it's here somewhere and I should talk about it. I can't find it. Where is it? 
Where is it? Because I know I'm using it in this formula. There it is. Ambrosinide. Ambrosinide from Cinerome, I believe. It's either Simrise or Cinerome. Ambrosinide is probably the most known for molecule in Dior Sauvage. It's what puts, you know, Dior Sauvage is what put Ambrosinide on the map basically as the must have material for perfumers. And to be honest, it's nice, but it's not one of those materials that you can easily fit in any perfume. It's not as forgiving as Amber Extreme in a sense of versatility. Uh, Cause when I smell Ambrosinide, to me, it's very spicy, dark. It's the typical dry woody amber profile like in all these other woody amber materials, but there is a definite spiciness to it. And it's almost, it's almost snappy and peppery, spicy, kind of like in a, I don't wanna say a nutmeg kind of way, but you know what I mean by spicy, where it's just got that subtle peppery spiciness to it that tickles your nose. And it's, it doesn't work well in most formulas, at least when I've tried it. It works well in masculine creations. Um, I had a hard time trying to use it in anything feminine because usually a lot of feminine creations don't call for a dry woody amber that smells spicy. Uh, it, to me, it's, it's ambrosinite is just a very good masculine woody amber. So let me put that back there because I am going to use you tonight. So that's it with the woody ambers. Let me go back and pull out another bin and see what the next category is that we're going to talk about. Okay, so this next category is your aldehydes. And this bin for me is a hodgepodge of different aldehydes. I keep some of my numeric, uh, numeric aldehydes in here, like your, you know, C14 peach, C16, you know, coconut and all those other ones that typically aren't aldehydes but because they are so-called aldehydes, I keep them in my aldehyde bin so I know where to find them and it's just easier. So what are my most loved aldehydes? I'm just gonna pull them out right here because I know exactly which ones that I'm always reaching for the most. Okay, I think that should do it. So, of all the aldehydes, I mean, you've got your, you know, C10, decanyl, all your, your, your well-known, I want to say your well-known aldehydes, like your C10, decanyl, C11, C12, MNA, you know, all those I usually don't reach for, if at all. Um, and I, I almost feel like there's two aldehydic materials that kind of replace all of those. So the ones that I reach for the most, I believe this one's from IFF. Uh, it's intra-11 aldehyde. And to me, it's just the best way to describe it. And I'm gonna put this one in, I'm gonna talk about both of these at the same time. And this one is called Aldehyde Supra from Ferminich. I believe it's Ferminich. So, the reason why these two are my most reached for aldehydes is because, oh, how should I put this? It's kind of like, if you think of damascones, like you've got damascone alpha, beta, delta, gamma, they all have that damascone smell with subtle differences. And then there's damascinone, which smells like all the damascones combined. That's what these two aldehydes are to me. These are the damascenones of the aldehyde world, where these two almost smell like your C12, C10, C11 combined. It has all the facets combined in these ones. And I think probably, I mean, they both smell similar to me. One may be a little bit more citricky and one leans a little bit more floral, which I think the intra-11 aldehyde leans a little bit more floral in a rosy way, where aldehyde supra leans a little bit more citrusy to me. 
but they both smell in the same aldehydic fashion, the same kind of characteristics where from your C11, C10, C12, where it's bright, fatty, floral, citric, sharp, you know? So these are my two most reached for, and it just depends on what the formula or the what the fragrance calls for what am i trying to achieve if it's a floral fragrance you know i'll probably reach for the intro 11 aldehyde if it's more of a citric and i need something that just pierces a little bit more on the top i might reach for aldehyde supra sometimes i'll try both in separate trial batches and see which one just fares better uh, but those are my two reach for aldehydes uh, the other ones I really don't reach for that much anymore ever since I picked these two up. These two just work wonderfully for me. The only thing is, is they're super, super, super strong. And when I mean super strong, I'm talking about you're going to dilute these down to 0.1% or even this one is at 0.01%. I mean, they're really, really strong. And when I use aldehydes, I'm always using them in trace amounts. Far, far, far below, you know, one part per thousand, usually not even detectable in a formula at all, ever. Always trace amounts because they're that strong. Unless I'm really, really going for an aldehydic note. Uh, but usually if I'm going for an aldehydic note, I wouldn't just reach for this and just use this in access of. I would find other aldehydic-like materials that'll help and then still use traces of this to carry it further. So those are the two uh, most used aldehydes of my aldehyde bin. I'd say my sec second runner up for a favorite is your classic C12 Loric. Uh, C12 Loric to me is the most unique of all the aldehydes because it's the soapiest. So if there's ever something in a, in a fragrance where I'm like, I need something soapy, and I've already used all my, you know, my powdery notes are in there. My, you know, my orris and, you know, iris notes are in there. My musts are helping powder it up. I've got some rose in there to powder up, but I still need something soapy, something clean and soapy. C12 Loric does the job. Again, just trace amounts. That's all you need, trace amounts. And it'll clean and soap up that, that uh, fragrance. And then probably my third runner-up is a favorite aldehyde is my transfor uh, decanal and this is pretty much um, my go-to if I need just a little bit more citrus kick because uh, it has of all the aldehydes that I have this is the most citric smelling and it's focused more on the orangey tangerine kind of you know citric actually smells pretty tangerine but it's again transfor decanal is super super strong i've got this diluted down to 0.01 percent and again when i'm using this in a formula trace amounts always trace amounts undetectable almost but just the little tiny bit will do it will really uh zest up a perfume especially if i already have something like tangerine or mandarin featured in the the fragrance and i'm like i just need something just a little bit more just to kick it up a notch without actually adding in more you know mandarin essential oil i'll grab the transfer Dec decano trace amounts usually gives that tangerine note just a little bit more lift all right that was easy aldehyde bin done i'm not going to talk about the rest because i don't reach for them that often so Let's go check out another bin. This bin right here is probably my most favorite bin to rummage through because this is what I call my sweet gourmand edible kind of bin. This is my foodie bin. That's anything where I need sweet, decadent, edible, edibleness, gourmand kind of uh, notes. I reach for this bin. So let me just pull out a couple <laughs> a couple things here oh it's so hard to choose if i only want to pick a couple oh that's a good one right there and yeah, we'll talk about that one 
and we'll talk about that one. Okay, I'm gonna just narrow it down to those two. Um, let's see, the first I wanna talk about is your vanillins. And I would say, obviously, I could talk about just straight up vanillin powder, like vanillin. Um, and it's probably the most commonly used one. Even I reach for it all the time. If I need a vanilla-like note, vanillin just does the job. It's the, it's the workhorse material for gourmand sweetness. Um, but what I don't like about vanillin is the discoloration that you get over time, especially if you're, if you're using a lot of vanillin in your perfume. Like if you're reaching something like over 1% of the perfume formula is vanillin, you'll notice over time that that, that perfume is gonna change color and darken with age. And I don't like that. So I usually reach for ethyl vanillin nowadays, but because ethyl vanillin is stronger than vanilla, vanillin, regular vanillin, you just have to be careful about your dosage. You have to dose it much, much less than you would regular vanillin because it's that much stronger. Now, smelling the difference between ethyl vanillin and regular vanillin, there is a difference in scent. To me, ethyl vanillin is slightly, it's hard to describe because to me, when I say whiter, I mean it's cleaner and creamier and almost like a ice cream, milky kind of vibe. It's a cleaner version of vanillin. So I just call it, I call it white vanillin. Uh, and regular vanillin to me, is a little bit more darker, almost like there's a hint of tonka in, in there. And it just has, a, it's like the darker side of vanilla. So ethyl vanillin is what I usually reach for nowadays for any kind of my vanillin needs. I just have to dose it really, really carefully. Um, another vanillic material that I really, really, really love, isobutavan. I forget who makes Isobutavan. Maybe it's Furminich, maybe it's IFF. Actually, you know what? I think it's Givaudan. I think Givaudan makes true Isobutavan. Be careful of imposters with Isobutavan because I think there are some generic off-branded Isobutavans out there. Uh, if you want the real stuff, Givaudan is the real deal. And to me, Isobutavan is, I love it. It's like, to me, isobutavan is even more so creamier than ethyl vanillin. It's like the creamiest of the bunch. If you want to get a vanillic note that almost smells like you would like scoop it up and just pour it and it would slowly drip out because it's just so rich and so creamy. It's almost molasses like, not dark or smelling like molasses. I mean, just the consistency. Isobutavan does that perfectly. It's that typical white, creamy ice cream kind of note to it. It's just the creamiest of all the vanillics, I would say. I love Isobutavan, but it's super, super strong. I would say it's probably, it's stronger than regular vanillin, that's for sure. I don't think it's as strong as ethyl vanillin. Could be on par but it definitely is something I use in very low dosage. Like I usually uh, use isobutavan in combination of either the vanillin or ethyl vanillin. But to me, isobutavan is something that you would never push up as the star of the show because it's this thing is so strong, it can easily take over. Um, so it's something that I just use in conjunction with vanillin or ethyl vanillin, usually in the lower amounts where the ethyl vanillin or regular vanillin would be the higher amount of the two. But I love, I love Isobutavan so much. It's so awesome. Uh, let's see, I took these out for a reason. Okay, chocolate. There is so many different ways you can do chocolate. Like you could even go get, you know, chocolate essence or chocolate, like everybody makes a chocolate base or you can get Coco Absolute and there's just, to me, if you want to do chocolate, you cannot beat Choco Van. I, I believe it's made from IFF, or maybe it's 
It could be Givaudan. It's either IFF or Givaudan, but Choco Van is the epitome, the best chocolate note that you can, in my opinion, if you want rich, creamy, decadent milk chocolate, Choco Van is the real deal. You can't beat it. It's every time I smell it, it just smells like I'm smelling, like if I took a Hershey's chocolate bar and melted it down and then I'm stirring it and it's in its liquid form and I just smell smell it, that's Choco Van. It's perfect, you can't beat it. Choco Van, for your chocolate notes. Enough said, I can't, I can't say anything more. It's, that is the one. Um, another, another gourmand uh, sweet material from Ferminich, Honey Signature. Uh, a lot of people are always chasing down the elusive honey note. I need a sweet honey note and I want to, you know, they try to make their own honey accords. And, you know, there's other things like Honey Meal Essence that is sold by this brand or, you know what, just stop chasing the honey note and get Honey Signature from Ferminich and be done with it. They've perfected it. It, to me, Honey Signature is dead on a rendition of just your standard run-of-the-mill honey that like, let's say if you're driving down the road and you're driving down a country road and you see a little farmhouse and there's like a little, a little booth on the side of the road where this old man, you know, makes his own honey from his own trees and he bottles it up and he's like, here, you wanna buy a bottle of, you know, organic honey, $5 for this canister and then you smell it because it's so authentic. This is it. This is it. Now this is not going to be your typical scent of honey. Like if you went to the grocery store and found, oh, there's some honey that I can pour on my pancakes and I, I pick this bottle off the shelf and I open up and smell it. This doesn't smell like that because the stuff that's sold on the shelves of the grocery store is overloaded with like glucose and sugars and sweeteners. So it's a different scent. Honey Signature is a true rendition of raw honey in its natural form. Uh, so if you want to take the gourmand rote of a sweet honey, you would probably take Honey Signature and just mix it with a little ethyl maltol or something like that to sweeten it up, to sugarize it. Or maybe a little Honey Signature with ethyl vanillin to help sweeten it and sugarize it. But if you want an authentic, raw, like honey notes, like just pulled straight from the honeycomb and they cut the honeycomb up and you've got all this sap and you smell it, honey signature from Ferminich, you cannot beat it. Just get it and be done with it and stop chasing the honey note because they make it, it's in this. <laughs> um, another favorite reach for me for sweet gourmands. Um, so Tonka bean or the Tonka note I mean, there's so many ways you can do Tonka. I mean, you can get Tonka Bean Absolute. You can just grab Kumarin, like a, the Kumarin powder, which, you know, Tonka Bean itself is primarily like 70% Kumarin anyways. It's, it's loaded with Kumarin, so people just use Kumarin. I find that, uh, oh God, I'm gonna butcher this one. I, I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation yet again. I think it's a bicyclolactone or bicyclolactone or something like that. It starts with a bicyclo something lactone. And to me, it's a smoother uh, version of Kumarin, where Kumarin to me has a little bit of brown grittiness to it in the scent. There's just a brown grittiness to Kumarin, which, which is fine. If, if, you know, it's a classic material. But if you want that kind of Kumarin-like scent without the brown grittiness, and it's something just a little bit more smoother, uh, bicyclolactone, I'm gonna have to Google this because <laughs> I know I'm butchering how it's pronounced. But uh, I, I should probably look at the actual bottle underneath here, but it'll take me too long to find it. But yeah, because I handwrite all my labels and I abbreviate, so I don't know the full actual name of it because I abbreviate everything, but I think it's bicyclone lactone. Um, yeah, that's the one that I usually reach for first for my Kumarin needs. Um, if I want something in the vein of just a, a typical traditional darker 
Tonka like scent. I'll go for Kumarin, but I'm really digging this uh, Bicyclone Lactone a little bit more. It's just a little bit more cleaner and more smoother in my opinion. The last material, actually, you know what? I should have, where is it? It's, I should have talked about this one. The most reached for material in my sweet gourmand bin, by far, ethyl maltol. I'm surprised I didn't talk about this first. Ethyl maltol is, you would be surprised how often uh, ethyl maltol, ethyl maltol, however you want to pronounce it, is used in fragrances. Of course, um, uh, Thierry Mugler's uh, Angel is known for the, the epic overdose of, you know, ethyl maltol. It's like a 0.8, almost 1% of the formula. I don't ever use it in that ridiculous high amount. I don't even dare try to go above, you know, one part per thousand. Because to me, even in trace amounts is super, super effective to just sweeten up the fragrance. To me, ethyl maltol used in trace amounts just sweetens up anything that you already have that's fruity in the in the fragrance or anything gourmand. So example, I have a fragrance, you know, it's it's all built out. I'm using vanillin or ethyl vanillin. And for some reason, I'm like, I just need to sweeten it up a little bit more without actually putting in more vanillin or, or ethyl vanillin. Trace amounts of ethyl maltol will just amplify the vanillin sweetness. Uh, same thing with fruity notes. Let's say if I have a peachy kind of notes in in the fragrance and I'm like, you know what, I need to sweeten it up just a, you know, a hair bit more without actually adding in more peachy materials. Trace amounts of ethyl maltol will amplify the sweet fruitiness without, you know, without it overbearing. Now, of course, if you go above trace amounts, it's just going to start smelling like candy, candied peaches. But uh, yeah, I love ethyl maltol. I use it in almost everything, even in a, f in a fragrance where it doesn't necessarily need to be sweet. Even just in trace amounts just gives a pleasantness to anything, in my opinion. I love ethyl maltol. And then the last one I want to talk about is one that I actually don't reach for that often, but it's something that I really enjoy having in my bin and I need need to find a way to use this. Uh, and that is just your standalone coffee bean absolute. Um, there's different ones that you can get. I believe this one that I've got here was from libertynatural.com. And when I mean there's different ones, if you want a good authentic coffee note, like some people again are trying to reinvent the wheel by doing all these different pyrazines and all these different molecules and making up their own coffee just get coffee bean absolute they also have a coffee bean co2 sfe extract the only difference between the two is the obviously the 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 co2 extract while yes it smells nice uh it's a little bit short-lived so it's not as long lasting as the absolute and it's just a little bit more lighter, meaning you can just dose it a little bit more heavier. The coffee bean absolute, I have this diluted pretty low, 1%, and it's powerful, like powerful. But I have not yet to this day used it because I haven't made a fragrance that features coffee as a note. Um, I want to, but... As of today, I have not used it, but I'm dying to because Coffee Bean Absolute just smells so, it just smells like bright sunny mornings. Like when I wake up and make a pot of coffee and you smell the coffee brewing, it's just perfect. Okay, Sweet and Gourmand Bin, check. We are done with that one. Let's go on to the next bin of materials. Okay, so this bin here, is my spicy bin. And it's mostly, I would call the gourmand spicy. Like if I need spicy, it's hard to describe what spicy means because spicy means different to everybody. So this is what I consider my foodie gourmandish spicy bin. And the ones that I reach for by far the most. Uh, let me see, let me pull out this. Pull out this. 
pull out this, this, this. Okay, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four. Pull out this. And no, actually, I won't pull that out because I don't reach for it that often. Okay, so let's talk about my most used spicy materials. Um, probably easily by far my go-to for anything spicy if I want spicy zesty sharp piercing pink pepper oil is by far my number one reach my number one go-to it's like it's almost like one of my favorite materials to work with because it just works in so many different things like it's highly overdosed and like a lot of men's fragrances it works so well in women's fragrances it's just a great zesty lively poppy uplifting material easy to work with um, the only thing is with the any actually this goes along with any of these spicy materials that I'm going to talk about is I always reach for the co2 extracts the you know the the SFE extracts I never ever really reach for regular essential oils anymore when it comes to my spicy materials. It's always the, C, the CO2 extracts because they're just so much cleaner and so much more refined. Um, if I were to take like a pink pepper, just standard essential oil and side by side smell that versus the CO2 extract pink pepper, easily uh, tell a difference that the CO2 is much cleaner, zestier. Uh, even when I had a friend over that I was making a fragrance for, and he said, I want pink pepper in my fragrance. And I was like, well, which kind do you want? I was like, smell both of these. He didn't even blink an eye. And he was just like, no, this one. And he pointed to the CO2. He's like, that's the pink pepper for sure. So even to the untrained nose, knows that the CO2 SFE versions are better smelling. So pink pepper, without a doubt, my most used spicy material. Uh, what's my second most used? Cardamom CO2. Um, cardamom though for me is probably it leans towards more masculine for me I don't use cardamom that often in a woman's fragrance it, it's it's hit or miss in a woman's fragrance for me like it might pair well with to spice up a rosy note if there's any anything rose in the you know feminine composition but uh, it works fantastic in you know masculine creations, especially woody masculine creations. Cardamom just works so good in that. So cardamom CO2 extract is my number two go-to. Um, another one that I reach for a lot, nutmeg CO2 SFE extraction. Um, again, to me, nutmeg and cardamom are kind of like in the same vein where um, I, I could easily use nutmeg in a lot of men's fragrances, um, but you could easily use nutmeg in a lot of uh, feminine's, you know, creations as well, because nutmeg to me is the typical gourmand spicy. It's very easily identified when somebody smells nutmeg, they think of, you know, Christmas cookies or baking or anything that has to do with food, because everybody knows what nutmeg smells like. Um, but not a lot of people know what pink pepper smells like or, car or, or cardamom because cardamom is not often used in foods as like something like nutmeg is. Uh, let's see, another one I reach for quite a bit, black pepper uh, CO2. Uh, not as much as the other ones, but if I need to enhance my pink pepper like say i want to further the peppery zestiness but i don't want to you know carry on the pink pepper i just need uh just something a little bit more sharper um because to me the pink pepper versus black pepper pink pepper has a definite roundness to it there's just this hue of roundness like there's an aura to the pink pepper that i really like whereas black pepper is more discreet but it's there and it's discreet, but it's very sharp. It kind of pokes through the mix in a very discreet way. And I like that. So if I ever need to amplify some spiciness without actually, you know, featuring a spicy note, the black pepper, usually like maybe one part per thousand, just kind of does the trick. Uh, the last two, now it's a shame that I don't use this that often because it's probably 
in the fragrance world, it's one of those notes that people seem to adore, and that's ginger, like fresh ginger. It's super, super trendy uh, nowadays. And of course, I've got gin, you know fresh ginger, CO2, F uh, SFE extracts, and it smells lovely. It smells like freshly cut ginger, like co ice cold ginger that you pulled out of your fridge and you're just cutting it up. And it's just, it's very, very uh, sharp and very ginger-like. And I love it. It's just, I don't reach for it that often because, I don't know, I'm not really a fan of the ginger note as most of the, you know, fragrance enthusiast community, you know, fragrance lovers are. Um, yeah. But I did want to talk about it because I do think it smells lovely. But you got to get the CO2 version. Um, and then the last of the spicy materials that I probably don't reach for that often and I should, I really should, and that's Elimi. Um, Elimi, oh, I love it because it's, it's like, to me, it smells like lemon pepper and the same kind of lemon pepper that you can buy from the grocery store, like from the, the jars that are sold by McCormick or whatever. And it's just like the seasoning, the lemon pepper seasoning. To me, that's what Alimi smells like. It's very citrusy and lemony and very peppery in a almost like a black pepper kind of way, like black pepper meets lemon zest. And I love it. And I've got different kind of Alimis. And the one obviously I reach for the most if I ever do reach for an Alimi, and actually it's sitting right here, and that's my Alimi CO2 SFE from Firminich. My second runner-up of the best Alimi that I've ever smelled is from Robert Tett, and that's called Alimi Heart, which is an extract of different fractions of Alimi, and he chose the best fractions and made a base of it. So this Alimi Heart from Robert Tett is probably the cleanest and most refined and also slightly with a floral kind of undertone. It's hard to describe. There's a nice delicate floralcy to it. And there's no off-putting dirty notes that you would find in typical Alimi essential oil, which is why I never really use it. Uh, so for anything Alimi, I always grab my CO2 extract Alimi or my Alimi heart from Robert Tetz. Well, that was an easy bin. Let's go on to, I believe, the last bin, but this last bin's a big one. It's actually two bins. So let's grab it and wrap this video up. Okay, I had to save this one for last because anything that covers citruses, because there's so many different kinds of citruses out there, there's just too much to talk about. And I knew that's why I was gonna save it for last. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, obviously, the ones that I reach for the most in you know, various different kinds of formulas, the ones that I think are the easiest ones to use. Let me pull this out. Yeah. And then I wanna, I wanna talk about a couple that I don't reach for that much because I, I find that they're not worth the money. And I'll pull this one out. Okay, so actually, you know what? Hold on. Let me the first one I'm going to say I reach for by far the most of all the citruses is lemon essential oil. Uh, I find that lemon is probably the easiest to work with um, because you can use excess amounts of it and it never really overpowers a blend. Um, I've used lemon essential oil you know, up to 8%, almost 10% of the formula. And depending on what else you have you know, in the formula, obviously has to play a role in it or else you know you can use too much but it's just one of those things that it never gets in the way because there's just something about lemon essential oil that's it's not very full body but it's very terpy and very zesty and it's just it's it's something that's just easy to work with however depending on where you source your lemon oil from does vary in scent, and that's what I've noticed. Um, the two that I reach for the most are probably either from Italy, which is usually Sicily, um, and also 
uh, Argentina. Argentina is another one. So what's the difference between these two? To me, the Argentinian lemon oil smells a little bit more juicy, but less terpy. And what I mean by terpy, meaning it's juicy, but less zesty, less sparkly. If you want tart, sparkly lemon, the Italian, uh, for, you know, is probably the better choice. So I always find that the the lemon from Italy is my go-to number one. I, I really don't reach for the Argentinian variety unless I want a toned down version or a toned down lemon. It's still nice, but I find that the lemon from Italy just, I like the, the zestiness and the sharpness and the tartness a little bit more in a lemon. So I reach for the Italian lemon. Um, obviously the next runner up for the most used citrus is gonna be bergamot. However, bergamot uh, essential oil is IFRA restricted as actually a, a lot like probably 80 you know 80 percent of citruses are our IFRA restricted to some degree so always double check your IFRA restrictions when regarding natural citruses now synthetic ones that's a different ball game natural citruses I'm talking naturals right now uh, bergamot essential oil um, I actually what I like to do is like this one right here is from Italy and it is a standard run-of-the-mill bergamot essential oil that is not um, refractionated it's not uh, ferro you know Kumar and whatever removed it's not because you know IFRA restrictions is because it's a skin sensitizing you know material so if you spray it on your skin you go out into the sun it's you know it's photosensitive you know sensitivity well could leave like red marks on your skin and that's when you can get the that what they call FCF or the you know the 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 cleaned up version of bergamot so it doesn't you know burn your skin so much however what I found is that the difference between the FCF, you know, cleaned up ones versus the straight up raw natural bergamots. I like the smell of the raw natural bergamots better because the, the cleaned up refined FCF, you know, IFRA, you know, approved bergamots to me smell watered down. There's something missing from it that I, not to say I don't like it, but I feel like the natural bergamot essential oil just smells so much better. So what I do is in a formula, if I want to go bergamot heavy, I'll reach for my, actually let me swap these back. That one belongs over there. I'll reach for my bergamot essential oil, the raw stuff, the non cleaned up one, the one that is heavily IFRA restricted. And I'll take it in my formula and bring it up to that IFRA restricted point, not to exceed it, but to keep it there, right under that level. And then I'll continue and carry on even further if, you know, if I need more bergamot with the FCF, you know, cleaned up variety. Um, and that's just how I use my bergamot. So if you don't have access to the clean refined FCF, you know, IFRA approved bergamot. The next best thing is where did it go? Oh, bergamot Jivco by Jivodan. Surprisingly, is a pretty convincing bergamot synthetic. I was shocked when I smelled this. And what I do like about it is it's a little bit more longer lasting than the naturals. And you'll find that with any synthetic rendition uh, will always last a little bit longer than the natural. Not by much, but just by a little bit. So if there's ever a time where you're like, I love this bergamot. It doesn't last that long. It only lasts like maybe 15 minutes in the first opening of the spray. I need it to last longer. What do I do? Just grab some bergamot Jivco and find a nice ratio blend between natural bergamot with bergamot Jivco. 
and it works. It just extends it just ever so slightly into the mids. I mean, it doesn't drag it fully into the mids, but it does, you know, extend it just by a little bit and it works. Uh, so that's it. So we've got lemon we covered, bergamot we covered. So let's cover some oranges. I have a love-hate relationship with orange materials. And that is because there's so many freaking varieties of orange and it gets a little overwhelming to to know which ones to choose so the first one i'm going to talk about is mandarins which technically isn't a orange it's like a different variety of orange but i i find that of the orange type uh materials mandarin is my go-to it's my first choice and you can choose from mandarin green mandarin yellow mandarin red and the differences being the green is probably the most zesty and probably, dare I say, bergamot-like. It's not floral-like bergamot, but it has a zestiness, uh, almost like a bergamot lime kind of zestiness. On the opposite end of the spectrum, you have mandarin red, which is probably the most orange like i would say it's the sweetest of the mandarins then you have mandarin yellow which is right in the middle it's kind of zesty kind of sweet and mandarin yellow is my always my first go-to and it just works but you have to be careful where you get your mandarin essential oil from because it varies from not only retailer to retailer but it also varies from factory to factory how it's harvested all the growing conditions all that you know all that crap so I think the best mandarin yellow that I've come across right now, the mandarin yellow essential oil, is probably from uh, EdenBotanical.com. And the second best, uh, I don't really have a second best. That's like, that's the one I go to most, almost 99.9% .9 of the time. It's like, why, why try to use something second best when it comes to an oil, you know what I mean? So the Mandarin Yellow from Eden Botanical is my by far go-to for anything orange needs. However, there's so many different kinds of oils when it comes to orange. So you've got sweet orange, blood orange, um, tangerine, mandarin, <laughs> clementine, all these different kinds of oranges. And it's funny because I, I own them all, but I don't really reach for them because it's, 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 hard, to dis, it's hard to explain or describe. Because when you smell them all, they do all have their subtle nuances and differences. But to me, an orange is an orange, <laughs> to be honest with you. An orange is an orange to me. And yeah, and don't forget orange bitter. I mean, that's a different one too. And to be honest with you, when it comes to orange, orange oil, I would uh, just grab whatever floats your boat, to be honest. I mean, you can go and be like me and buy every variety out there but I find myself now overwhelmed with choices, uh, choosing an orange. But if I had to choose uh, one that smells the nicest, there's something that I really, really dig about clementine essential oil. There's something very reminiscent of the, the, the seediness and the pithiness of an orange that I really find intriguing with the clementine essential oil. Now I haven't reached for it and I probably won't anytime soon, but I want to because it smells really darn nice. Okay, grapefruits. I have a love-hate relationship with grapefruits. Mostly because one, natural grapefruit essential oil can go bad quickly um, and even with if you use fresh you know let's say you just bought the essential oil it just arrived on your doorstep and you use it in a blend you make a perfume with it even in the perfume with all the you know perfumers alcohol the ethyl alcohol over time it still has it still has the uh, 
chance of kind of going bad over time. And that scares me a little bit. So I try not to reach for a natural uh, essential oil when it comes to grapefruit, but I do own them all. I have white grapefruit, I've got pink grapefruit, I've got red grapefruit. If I were to choose one, I always go in the middle, pink grapefruit. White seems to smell the most transparent yet zesty and tart. Uh, red seems the sweetest. Uh, pink is right in between the middle. It's kind of zesty, kind of sweet, and that's why I always go for the middle ones. But if I were to choose a synthetic, which I 99.9% .9 of the time I do when it comes to grapefruit, <coughs> my two favorites, my two go-tos, uh, let's see, where did it go? I'm using it in this blend. It's here somewhere. There it is. Methyl pamplemousse. You cannot go wrong when it comes to a grapefruit synthetic when it comes to methyl pamplemousse. However, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't smell like authentic grapefruit. It has that weird tart, pithy grapefruitness, but it doesn't really smell of true, authentic, lifelike grapefruit. If you want a synthetic that is true, lifelike, Fermanich makes their standalone grapefruit base, which is a, a synthetic. And that's closer. To me, it smells better than methyl pamplemousse, but it's still not a dead ringer. It's still not a dead ringer. Because if I actually smell real pink grapefruit, yeah, that's a dead ringer. That, I mean, obviously, it's the real deal. Um, <clears throat> grapefruit base is a good one. But if you really want to take it there, I, I believe this one is from Simrise or maybe Cinerome. It could be Cinerome. It's called Pam Zest. Pam Zest is probably, in my opinion, the best synthetic for the grapefruit note. It's, it smells like, it doesn't have the, as much zesty, pithy kind of sourness that you'll find in Furminich grapefruit base or the methyl pamplemousse. But what this has that these other two lack is the juiciness. There's some sort of body and heft to it that smells really nice. I, I find the Pam Zest is my favorite as far as the synthetic grapefruit note. Um, now let's do a couple honorable mentions. Um, honorable mentions, which one should I talk about? Okay. These two have been kind of my favorites. Um, I believe IFF makes this, it's called Lemon Isle. It's a synthetic lemony material and it's super strong. The only downfall with lemon isle is it has a cleaner solution kind of vibe because it's a synthetic, so it's not really juicy. It's not really, you know, uh, zesty like lemon zest. It's just this kind of synthetic y kind of lemony vibe. But what I do like about it is it's way longer lasting than lemon essential oil. So if you need to extend your lemon note into the mids, lemon isle will do that. However, don't be fooled by the, like if you research lemon isle and look at the longevity on a paper strip, you'll find online that lemon isle is claimed to last like 250 hours or something ridiculously long like that. No, it does not last that long. I've tested on paper strips and it probably lasts maybe two days max, which is about 48 hours. However, that's a heck of a lot better than standard lemon essential oil, which only lasts maybe 10 to 12 hours on a paper strip. So it's about double the lifespan as far as longevity. So if you need to extend your lemon note into the, the mids a little bit, lemon isle does that, but just be careful with your dosing. It's pretty strong. I keep, it, uh, keep mine diluted down to 1% and I just kind of take it from there. 
Another one that's an honorable mention that I love is from Firminich, and this is called Citroasis Base. Citroasis Base is an oddball to me because it's a combination of things. It's a combination of lemon, grapefruit, and an ozonic quality to it. So that's it's it is a base. But there's something very commercialized smelling about this. And what I mean by that is you can easily use this as a standalone top note and be done. Like instead of trying to mix a little bit of, you know, let me drop some lemon essential oil, let me add a little bit of methyl pample mousse, let me add a little bit of uh, pre-cyclamone B for some ozonic notes, let me do all this. Instead of going through all that trouble, you can just try Citroasis base on its own and try and see how it fares from there. It, it works really nice. And it's just a very commercialized classic top note that if you want that nice, clean, summery, zesty, citrusy, you know, opening, Citroasis Base does that really well. It's pretty strong though. Don't let the scent fool you if you smell it from a bottle. Because when you smell it from a bottle, it doesn't appear to be that strong. I keep it diluted down. I have two different versions. I've got one down to 1% if I just need a subtle little boost of top notes. And then I keep another one at 5% that I use if I want to dose it a little bit heavier. But Citroasis Base, you should check it out. It's worth checking out. Um, okay. The last one, there's two more I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about one I think you should avoid. And then the secret ingredient that I probably should not tell you about, but I'm going to, because I'm sure libertynaturals.com will thank me for it. Yuzu. The yuzu note is tricky to do because for one, yuzu, uh, the natural essential oil is pretty expensive if you're trying to source it from Japan. Um, you'll find if, you know, a lot of people carry it, but the prices are so ridiculous for a, you know, a yuzu essential oil, which is very short lived. It's kind of like a lemon oil where it's only going to last 10, 12 hours on a paper strip. So why are you paying five times the price for this kind of oil? There's a secret. If you go to libertynaturals.com, go to their absolutes page. They list uh, Yuzu Bitter Absolute from Japan for a very, very affordable price. I think you can get like a 7 ml little bottle, little vial for under $25 or something like that. However, if you go to their essential oils page, uh, which is they sell a Yuzu Sweet, that same you know 7 ml vial is probably like $50 or something ridiculous. And I don't know why their pricing is like that, but they have a Yuzu Sweet and a Yuzu Bitter. The Yuzu Bitter is listed on their Absolutes page, and that's what I picked up. It's a dead ringer of Yuzu, in my opinion. Like, I've drank a lot of Yuzu, you know, beverages, and I love, you know, the, the Japanese kind of candies that are Yuzu flavored and things like that. And when I smell this, it's just like, yeah. That's yuzu. It's it's dead. It's dead on yuzu. This this is if I want a yuzu note, this is what I go for, and uh, it's stronger than a typical essential oil. So I keep it diluted down to I have a couple different bottles. I've got one again like diluted to two percent. If I just need a subtle little, subtle little kind of flick of yuzu in the formula, or five percent, uh, if I want to really you know feature a yuzu note. Now. I want to talk about the one that I think you should not bother getting if you want a yuzu kind of note. And I'd hate to talk you know, bad about you know, certain companies, but Givaudan makes a yuzu zest synthetic base. In my opinion, it smells nothing like yuzu. If anything, it smells like grassy grapefruit. <laughs> and it smells nothing like yuzu to me. There's nothing yuzu any yeah it smells like transparent grassy grapefruit so if you're ever looking at yuzu zest for Givaudan, thinking it's actually going to smell like yuzu you'll be disappointed don't bother it's a regretful purchase and i never reach for it 
And I think that's it. I think, uh, yeah, for citruses, that's it. Holy moly, we went to the hour mark again. Oh, yeah, yeah, three hours total between the three videos. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. I went through all my bins uh, cat category by category, picked out some of my favorite materials, some of my most used materials. The one thing I didn't talk about was a lot of the, you know, the obvious ones like your Izoe Super, Hedion HC. Of course, I'm not gonna talk about that because we're always gonna use that in almost all our blends regardless. So why bother? Um, so yeah, I went through all the bins. I gave you my favorites. I gave you my ones that I think you should not bother getting. I mean, still, by all means, try it. I mean, get it and try it for yourself. Don't take anything that I say too heavily because perfumery is all about trying, you know, buying and trying and then try again and then keep trying and buy them all. That's why I have so many materials. I think my material count of all the different individual materials now is at maybe almost 700 different materials, which is way more than I ever thought I would ever carry. But I have it now, and now I feel like I have too much because I have too many options to choose from when making a fragrance, and it makes it very difficult trying to choose. But I do have my favorites, and that's what this video series was about, showing you guys what are my favorite go-tos, what I think uh, is my most used uh, materials, and that you might find useful if you're ever trying to you know, purchase more things. So uh, with that being said, I'm rambling again. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Until next time.